Lord. Your Bible this evening, if you would, go to Galatians chapter 4, please. Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> Look with me at verse number 16, please. At Galatians 4 and verse 16, where the Bible says, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. Now, Father, add your blessing to uh, this scripture and others we'll look at this evening as we open up your word and study it together. And Lord, I pray that as Paul admonished these believers in the churches of Galatia, to be zealously affected always in a good thing, that we would understand what it is to be zealous. And so open our understanding tonight, and Lord, help me as I bring the, the lesson. I pray you'd help each listener as they listen tonight. Help those who are listening and watching by way of the live stream. Lord, minister to our hearts tonight. Speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody has a zeal for something. Some might be a zeal for pleasure, and some might be a zeal for work, and certainly some might have a zeal for money. Uh, I, like, I like a fellow in the Old Testament named Jehu. How many ever heard of Jehu? Uh, the Bible says, some of you might like Jehu because it says he drove furiously, and you took your driving lessons from him. But he, uh, he, he drove his chariot fur furiously, but Jehu was was taking over the kingdom after the house of Ahab. And his job was basically to utterly destroy everything and every remnant of Ahab's house. And he enjoyed it quite a bit. In fact, he invited somebody to come up with him and see his zeal for the Lord. And uh, I like that phrase, come see my zeal uh, for the Lord. <clears throat> Listen, a zealous man or a zealous Christian, is really a, a person or a man of one thing. It's not enough to say that a zealous person is earnest or hardy or uncompromising. This isn't on your list. Don't look down at your paper. Just li listen to me. It's not enough that he's wholehearted or fervent in spirit. A fervent, listen, a zealous Christian is one who is consumed with one thing and one thing only. And that is pleasing God. I want to please God in everything I do. He's swallowed up in that one thing. He lives for that one thing. He cares for that one thing. Whether he lives, whether he dies, whether he has health, whether he has sickness, whether he's rich, whether he's poor, whether he pleases man or doesn't please man, whether he's, he's thought well, well of or not thought of at all or thought foolish, whether he gives offense or whether he's wise, uh, whether he gets the blame or whether he gets praise, whether he gets honor or whether he gets shame, uh, the zealous man does not care at all. All he's concerned about, what he burns for, is to please God and to bring God glory. That is a zealous believer. That is a zealous Christian. He's consumed in the burning for Christ. And if he, if he happens to burn out or be consumed in the burning, that's okay. He's done the work that God appointed him to do. Be zealous. Now, zeal. Zeal is an eagerness or a desire to accomplish or obtain some object. Zeal. It's used 16 times in the Bible. The word zealous is used eight times in the Bible, and zealously is used twice. So over 26 times in the Bible we see zeal or zealousness used. And we know that a zealous person is contagious. Paul, here to the church of Galatia, reminded them that they had been zealously affected, but not in a good way. They had had some people enter in after Paul had left, and begin to uh, teach against the things that Paul had taught them. They begin to undermine the truths that Paul had begun to had laid down for these Christians, and they were 
hindering. Notice in chapter 5 and verse number 7, what Paul said, Ye did run well, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He's saying you had people come in and listen, they've zealously affected you, but not in a good thing. They've, they've, they've influenced you in the wrong way. And so he's trying to encourage them to be zealously affected in a good thing. It's interesting that the last time the word zealous is used in the Bible is in Revelation chapter 3. And it's used in reference to the Laodicean church. If you, if you uh, whether, whether that is, and by the way, they were seven literal churches, but it might represent too the seven ages of the church, church age, and it could represent the last days of the church. And if you know the Laodicean church, it thought it was rich and increased with goods and have ne- had need of nothing. But God had a whole different view, didn't He? And you know what God told him? In fact, look there with me. Will you just hold your finger there in Galatians? We'll come back to that. But I, we'll look at other scriptures tonight, so you might as well get used to turning your Bible. Revelation chapter 3. Again, it's interesting. He says, I know thy works in verse 15, Revelation 3, 15. I know that thou art neither hot nor cold, and I would thou wert hot, cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Isn't it amazing? how they saw themselves compared to how God saw them? Isn't it, isn't it sobering to you and me how we might be able to see ourselves and God see us completely different? Because our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And we may see ourselves completely different than God does. That's why David prayed, uh, Lord, search my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. David didn't search his own heart. He asked God to do it. Because God will see it differently than I see it. Okay? But notice what the Lord said. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness doth not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Here's it is. Be zealous therefore and what? Repent. The word to the Laodicean church was, hey, you know what you need to do? Be zealous. Be eager. Uh, Pursue this with great eagerness and passion. Repent. Turn yourself around and, 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 and get right with God. That was to the apathetic church. They had, they had everything, but you know what they had lost? They had lost any passion for Christ. They had lost their zeal. They had not had any any, any eagerness, any passion, any enthusiasm for the things of God. And so they're told by God to be zealous and to repent. Now, Paul told the people in Galatia to be zealously affected always in a good thing. What what, What should we be zealous about? What should we be passionate about? What should we be eagerly pursuing? I think number one is we should be zealous about the church. The church. Now look at John chapter 2, would you please? The Gospel of John chapter 2. We're right at the beginning of Christ's ministry, His earthly ministry. He's he's attended the, the marriage in Cana of Galilee. And he there He turns the, the, the water into grape juice. He did not turn it into fermented wine, okay? Just so you understand that. Uh, There is no word grape juice in the Bible, but he did turn it into, so wine, wine, you have to know the context, but it's it's very simple. If you think Jesus would drink fermented wine, when when the Old Testament says wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise, when the Old Testament says don't look on the wine when it moves itself aright in the cup, when it gives its color, in other words, when it's fermented, uh, you, you don't even look at it, then would the, if that's what the written Word of God says, would the living Word of God come along and contradict the written Word of God? Absolutely not. He cannot contradict Himself. 
And so if I knew nothing of any of the wording of the Bible, I would just say Jesus would not contradict the Old Testament. He would not contradict what God has already said. And so I know that that would not be fermented wine. But he does that in the marriage. But I want you to notice what happened after that. Look at verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Now, Every good Jewish man would go to Jerusalem three times a year. He would go for the Feast of the Passover, for the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of Pentecost. Those are the three feasts that everyone would go there. Now, Jesus was there because he's going to fulfill all of the Old Testament law. He would do fulfill everything that a Jew would want to do. And so he went to the temple, the house of God as we would refer it to, and, and he got angry at what he saw. He saw priests there who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money, and they were, they were selling the sacrifices for profit. They were, they were catching people who came to the temple with their sacrifice with them, and they would check the sacrifice over. You know, the lamb would have to be without blemish and without spot, and they would find some defect or something wrong, and they would say, no, this just won't do uh, but, but you know what? It is your lucky day because we happen to have some lambs right over here. And he'd look over to the guy at the table and with a wink of his eye say, here's a customer right here. And, and then they would make money and sell the lamb and make money off of it. And Jesus knew what was happening. And he knew that they were making merchandise of the people. And so Jesus sat and began to make a little scourge, a little a cord, if you will, a whip, and uh, he begins to take off on these guys. I mean, he dumped the tables over. And he swung the whip. And he drove them out of the temple. That's, that's, uh, that's a little different picture than most people picture Jesus, isn't it? Uh, but you know, when the, and I wonder what the disciples thought. They thought, whoa. Huh? And then somewhere... His disciples remembered, verse 17, this is the main thing, somebody thought of the scripture. Isn't that something? Somebody said, wait a minute, I think I remember reading this in the Old Testament somewhere. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. He said, man, does, does he have zeal? Man, look at his enthusiasm for the house of God. Boy, he loves this place. Are you? Let me ask you a question. Are you zealous? about church are you are you passionate about your church how passionate are you about church you say well now pastor you don't you know you don't have to go to church to be a christian no but if you're a good christian you'll want to go to church pretty simple i i read this week a fellow said they had an atm ministry at their church and of course i got skeptical right away until he said, by the way, there are people, there are churches that are doing that. They're putting ATM machines in the church. But this guy said, no, it's attendance, tithing, and ministry. Attendance, tithing, and ministry. Be there and give the Lord his tithe and then get involved serving. And I, I, think, I, I think I like that ATM, amen? But you know what? If you love Jesus Christ, you're going to love what he loves. And Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And so we ought to love the church. It's not Christ or the church. It's Christ and the church. They go together. They go, they go one with the other. And so the believer ought to be eaten up with zeal for the house of God. And so when, when someone says they're saved but they don't have any desire for the house of God or no desire for the people of God, no desire to gather together with the people of God. Listen, something's wrong. Something's not right. Something, 
Uh, listen, nothing ought to continually keep you away from the house of God. And, and we've got to get back to that again. I really, and, and by the way, if you don't deal with something that continually keeps you out of church, then God will deal with you. That's how it works. I want you to look at a verse that's familiar to us, but go back to the book of Hebrews. Will you look at Hebrews chapter 10? Most of you are familiar with it. You could probably quote it, but I want you to see something tonight. Romans, or, uh, Hebrews 10 and verse number 25. Most of you know it. Where the Bible says, Not forsaking the assembling ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. That's obvious to us. That's a command to gather together. But what about the verse after that? For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. And that's interesting. And sometimes you, you, we, we read those verses and we're trying to figure out what they mean. Well, what about the context in which we find them? Those verses follow up those who would forsake the assembling of themselves together as the manner of some is. In other words, they, they know what they should do. They know they should be gathered together in church. They know what they should be doing. And they willfully don't do it. And that's willfully sinning. How many times have you heard people say, well, I know that I should be there, but... Well, I know I should be doing this, but... And what they're saying is, they're just about to tell you why they willfully don't want to do what God says they should do. Now, God says, when that happens, then He says, after you've received knowledge of it, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. In other words, there's, there, there's nothing that can be done uh, to, to take care of that sin. Except what? Judgment. God will judge you for that sin. Because you're willfully doing that and not following what God wants. If, if, you're, if you sin, knowing it's a sin, and you willfully sin, then God says, I will chasten you for that sin. And I wonder how many folks are under the chastening hand of God because they know they ought to not forsake the assembling of themselves together, and they do. I mean, for, for less uh, reasons than they would ever miss work. For less reasons than they ever miss uh, an outing or, or getting together with friends. But they'll lay out a church. I'm more zealous about the house of God than that. See, there ought to be a zeal for the house of God. A zeal for the gathering together of God's people. Let me give you three reasons why. Number one, it pleases God. It pleases God. When God says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching, that's not a suggestion. I think that's a command. I believe that's exactly what God, God wants to do. And as a believer in Christ, I don't, I don't just have to obey the commands of God. I want to obey the commands of God. I delight to obey the commands of God. I want to do what God tells me to do. And when we say we assemble together at 9.30 Sunday morning and 10.30 Sunday morning and 6.30 Sunday night and 7 o'clock on Wednesday night, then those are the commands of God. And we obey His commands with love. If you love me, keep my commandments. So I want to show God I love Him. So I want to do what He says me to do. Talk is cheap. Prove your love by keeping His commandments. Anybody can say, oh, I love Jesus. I like the bumper sticker that says, you know, if you love Jesus, tithe. Anybody can honk. <laughs> I like that one. But I think it's pleasing to God. Number two, we ought to have a zeal for the church of God because it is a good testimony. It's a good testimony. When you look up and you see me standing in the pulpit right now, what are you looking at? Besides that, never mind. <laughs> you're not seeing, hey, you know what? You're not seeing Stan Slayball. You're seeing the, the shell, the, the, the body that I live in. 
The real sand sleigh ball is inside here somewhere. It's just the, the outward shell. The, the, real, the real soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, what you think, what you feel, what you want, that's inside. That, that you don't see. You just see the outside. What you're seeing is the soul holder, which is your body. Okay? And, and so you... We're, we're just, this is the body God gave us so we could function in this atmosphere. This is our space suit. Okay? This is what we each have to, in order to, to survive. Now, but anything we know about each other has to be manifested through our body. That's how we can communicate with one another. If you're going to know what I'm thinking... If you're going to know what someone is feeling, then it's going to be manifested through the body. Whether it's the voice, whether it's a gesture, I don't know, right? Probably. Huh? See, that's how we communicate. You watch the body. And, and well, I know what you're feeling. And, and th does your face reveal it? Yeah. Does your posture reveal it sometimes? Yeah. See? Every husband knows. You know what your wife's thinking. You don't even have, she doesn't have to say anything. You just watch her. Well, ladies, you can know what your husband's thinking sometimes. All you have to do is look at him. And you'll know what his reaction is. And so it, 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 you can know what they're thinking. I, I can look at my wife and I know exactly what's on her mind. Just by the way she looks or by the way she says what she says or maybe by the frying pan she has in her hand. I don't know. But I know. The body is the outward manifestation of the real you. The real me. So wait a minute. The Bible says the church is his body. So the manifestation of Jesus Christ to this world is us. What the world will think about Jesus Christ is what they see of his body. Or you're, you're part of the body of Christ. That's the church of Jesus Christ. And that's what people will see about Jesus. All the world knows about Jesus is what they see in you and me. That's all they know. If we're his body on this earth. If, we're, if, we're, if, we, man, if, listen, if we show grace, they'll know he's gracious. If we're merciful, they know he's merciful. If we're truthful, they'll know he's truthful. But we're, what, what they see, what they know of Christ is going to be in us. And they're going to see it in us because we're his body. And so we ought to have a zeal for the house of God because it's a testimony to the world. It's a testimony to them of Jesus Christ. So it pleases God. It's a testimony to the world. And then, of course, thirdly, it's a place of fellowship. It's a place of fellowship. A major part of a child growing up is they discover the importance of their body. They watch a baby finally discover their fingers and stick them in their mouth and look at them. And, and then when they see their toes and they discover their toes are there and sometimes they even can stick their toe in their mouth. I wouldn't advise trying that if I were you. Might hurt yourself at this time. But then they, then they discover, hey, these legs will walk. And they pull themselves up and pretty soon they start walking. Then they find out their tongue is there and their voice is there and they can start making noise and making sounds and pretty soon they learn to, to form words. And we're, it's funny how, isn't it? We get all excited when they can walk and talk and then all we spend our time is telling them to sit down and be quiet. <laughs> but we're excited that they can walk and talk. But you know, that's... Being aware of your body and how it works is... And by the way, the importance of your body is a mark of maturity. In fact, as you grow older, you learn the importance of taking care of your body. I mentioned the other day, when you're, when you're young and you're active, you just threw anything and any, everything you wanted into your body. How many of you did that? Huh? Didn't matter what it was. I, I was telling somebody the other day, they said they were going to McDonald's to eat. And I said, you know, there's a guy... I don't know where he is now. I, I think he, he bought a Big Mac and fry, I forget how many years ago. 
It's been years. And he has it on display, and it's still there. I mean, it hasn't changed. Doesn't decay, doesn't molt, doesn't, it's just sitting there after years. What do you think it is once you eat it and it goes in your stomach? I, I forget where I heard that, that somebody had done an autopsy on a guy and they, had like, they found like a french fry from McDonald's that had been there for like two years. Still in his gut. It just doesn't digest. Anyway, boy, isn't that a blessing? Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Let's all go eat at McDonald's, huh? You know, you, as you grow older, you learn you better take care of your body. As you grow older, you learn I'm only as good as the fuel I'm putting in it. And how many, how many feel it? How many of you are to the age? Now, some of you are too young. You don't understand. But how many are to the age to where if you eat something that isn't very good for you, you feel it? Huh? There you go. I mean, you know right away, man, I don't think I should have had that, you know? Uh, it, 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 you're learning the importance of the body, and you're learning, and that's just a mark of maturity. And, and, and it's a mark of maturity when you realize the importance of the body of Christ and your part and your place in the body of Christ and the importance for you to be there. It's a place to learn. It's a means to grow. It's an opportunity to serve the body of Christ. Each part of our body does something to take care of the rest of the body. We all, all your body works together. You know why my, you know why my body exists? It's to take care of me. Me. That's why it's here. You know what these hands do? They do what I want them to do. Right? I mean, if I got an itch, it's got to scratch it. Hmm? I want to look at something over there. My head gets the signal. Look over there. It's, it's here to serve me. But now, wait a minute. We are the body of Christ. So why are we here? To serve Christ. That's exactly right. To serve Jesus Christ. Why are you in church Wednesday night? To serve Jesus Christ. That's why you're here. That's why you ought to be here. He's the head of the body. He's the head of the body. And so we seek the mind of Christ and we follow his commands. We don't just come for what we can get. We come for what we can give. Don't get that consumer mentality. What can the church do for me? Huh? No, 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 no. What, where's my part in the body? What will be my function in the body? And, and what can I do to make sure the, the body functions the way it's, it's supposed to? Don't just... When you're not in church, you discourage other people. When they look and say, oh, they're not here tonight. Oh, I wonder where they are. Ever think about a brand new Christian? That, that when, when they come on a Sunday and they may get saved or they get baptized and then we don't just tell them, hey, come back next Sunday. We say, hey, you know what? We have a service on Sunday night. You ought to come back this evening, 6.30. And then, then they come back Sunday night or they come back on Wednesday night and they only see half the people come back. What message does that send to them? Oh, I guess not that big of a deal to come back on Sunday night or Wednesday night. How do we stress to them how important it is when they look around and see empty seats that were occupied on Sunday morning? And I know I'm preaching to the Wednesday night crowd. I understand that. But you, we, we, we need to understand why we're here. Every time you come in the door, I believe you're telling Jesus Christ, Jesus, I'm thankful you made me part of the body. And I'm here to function. I'm here to serve. I'm here to do what, what, what I'm supposed to do in your body, in the church. I'm going to, I, I appreciate the people in the church. I, I appreciate the other members of my body. See? 
And and the because the remember the hand can't say to the ear, I don't need you. The eye can't say to the foot, I don't need you. No, we all need each other. And so I appreciate the the members of the body. And so it's a, it's important. Someone said, don't be like a tick on a dog, just in it for what you can get out of it. Okay, don't be that way. Be zealous of church. Well, I could spend the whole time on that, but uh, we'll move on. We'll move on. I thought you'd be happy about that. All right. Number two, let's be zealous. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, would you please? Are you okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's be zealous about giving. Oh, yeah. Two people said amen. You want me to go back to church now, don't you? Yeah. Giving. Notice what Paul said here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He, said, he tells... He tells them, for his touching, in verse 1, for his touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, now watch, and your zeal hath provoked very many. And he's talking here about giving. Notice verse number 6. But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. He's talking about giving. Now, when you talk about giving in the New Testament, tithing is only where you begin. That's the beginning point. Any of these, any of these most of these early believers in the, old, in the New Testament had been from a Jewish background and they knew that tithe belonged to God. They knew what the Old Testament teaches. But the truth is, what he's dealing with here is sacrificial giving. Most of us don't understand sacrificial giving. When you think of Abraham, who was asked to sacrifice who? Isaac on the altar. You say, well, I, I, I said, we were talking about that one day, and I had someone say to me, well, I don't even know I want to serve a God who would ask you to sacrifice your child. And I thought about, well, wait a minute. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do you realize he sacrificed his son for you so you could have eternal life? But here's the thing. God... God is not saying that you'll have to, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, he's not saying that you'll have to put your child and raise a knife and take their life, but what he is saying is, are you willing to sacrifice your child? Are you willing to lay your child on the altar if God wants that child to be a missionary? God wants that child to serve him in some capacity? Are you willing to say, now, now wait, 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 wait now, you know, that... There's not a lot of money in that. You're right. Oh, there's other professions where you would do much, much better. Hmm? Yeah, there, there might be as far as if you're looking at finances. But are you willing to lay your children on the altar? Are you willing to allow them to serve God if it takes them thousands of miles away from you? Believe me, believe me, mom and dad, you'd rather have your child thousands of miles away from you in the will of God than living next door to you out of the will of God. You don't want that. And so God may, may ask you. There's many times parents hinder the calling of God in the lives of their children because they're holding on to them, not wanting them to go, and it hinders them. When we talk about sacrificial giving, it means this, that you give what is necessary for your existence. It means you give what is necessary for your existence. If, if after you have sacrificed, you can continue living like you always have, you haven't sacrificed. Sacrificial giving changes your lifestyle. It changes the amount of money you have to spend. It means you have to scale back your lifestyle. 
in order to give. And the truth of the matter is, the reason that we're in the, we're in the position we're in today, and I think the reason we have such a long list of unreached people groups in the world, is because God's people, and particularly in America, we have simply upped our standard of living. And we live better than we ever have before. And the world's dying and going to hell. We drive by, you drive by some houses and some places in, in, in Columbus and you look at that and you say, boy, look how tiny that house is. We don't even, most people won't even think of buying a house now that doesn't have the master bedroom and master bath. But there's a day in America when you never heard of such a thing. There was a hall bathroom. And everybody, and, and dad got it, mom got it, and then the kids fought for themselves. And hurry up. Hmm? That's how we live. That's how America lived. Hmm? You see, we just keep, keep moving up to a higher style of living, higher standard of living. And that simply means we're not sacrificing. When you, most, <clears throat> most Christians give out of their abundance and not by sacrifice. It's true. If you can spare it, it isn't a sacrifice. You know, I was thinking about this, and I don't know. I don't know if I've ever sacrificially given. I don't know. I don't know, Brother Jarvis, if if I've ever missed meals because I gave money to God. So I went without, didn't eat. Because I didn't have the money to buy, because I gave that money to God. I don't know that I ever sacrificed. We even had, for years in, a, in another church that, that we had, uh, we had a live on what you give Sunday. So whatever you put in the plate on a Sunday, you kept that. And whatever you usually kept, you gave that. Just flipped it around for a week. And we did that. But you know what, Brother Yoder? I still ate that week. I still lived like we did. Somehow we, we did it. And didn't seem to feel it. Have you, have you, have you ever really sacrificially gave? Zealous about giving. Zealous about giving to missions. Do you regularly give to missions? How many, how many missionaries would we support on the amount of money you give to missions? You look at the follow the faith promise and the Bulletin, and we're behind a little bit for the year. Not starts in September, so you're talking we're well over halfway. We've been probably 30 to 36 Sundays in, and if you're, you know, if you're $1,200 short, that's only like $40 a week. That only takes one or two people that said $20 a week or $40 a week and, and decided they couldn't do it. But it only take a few a few people saying, I think I can make that up. I think I'd give an extra $5 a week. I'd give an extra $10 a week. We could make that up. In fact, we could more than make it up. We could be looking to take more missionaries on. You see, if we would think about sacrificially giving and not just giving from our abundance. Just, hey, I'll give, but I don't want to affect my lifestyle. We have folks, we have folks who are praying about the mission trip to Mexico and and several of them had talked to me and said, man, I, I want to go. I'm just, we just don't have the money yet. And they're praying. And, and God may be speaking to somebody's heart here or several somebodies who say, well, we, we're, we don't have the time to go, but we sure could help somebody go. And maybe you'd be the answer to somebody's prayer to help them go. And really, you'd put $500 in. It wouldn't, it wouldn't cause you to miss a meal next week. See, 
Just, just be zealous about giving. Be zealous about giving. Zealous about the church, zealous about giving. Let me give you number three. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. You got real quiet on me. <laughs> got real quiet. Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> Start with verse number 13 where he says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of what? Good works. Zealous of good works. Are you zealous to do the work that God commanded you to do? Are you zealous to do the works that God has ordained for you to do? Are you, are you zealous to reach the lost? Are you zealous to give the gospel? Are you zealous to get flyers out for the big day? Are you, are you zealous to teach a Sunday school class? Are you zealous to help in the children's church? Are you zealous to be an usher? Are you zealous to work in the nursery so others can be blessed by the service? Are you, are you zealous to be part of the RU ministry? Are you zealous to go to the nursing home on a Sunday? Are you zealous of good works? We're here to work. We ought to be zealous about work for God. It's going the second mile. It's, it's not just going one mile, it's being willing to go two as Jesus spoke of. It means to serve even though you're hurting or you don't feel 100%. You know, there's nowhere in the Bible that says you don't have to serve God if you don't feel good. I know. So ah, I just don't feel like it. Well, then do it and don't feel like it. Well, I just hurt. How many understand you're just to that point in life where something's going to hurt every day? Are you there? Might as well get up and go anyway. I have people who tell me those excuses, and yet I know, I know people in this room, and I know what they go through physically, and I know how they hurt, and yet they just keep going. They don't talk about it. They don't say it to anybody. But they're here, and they're doing what, they, what they're supposed to do, and they're serving the Lord. Because they understand they have a zeal for good works. There just comes a point. We've been, we've been sold a bill of goods in our society that you ought to never be in pain. Ever since they came up with that 1 to 10 thing when you go to the hospital or the doctor, you know, 1 to 10, where's your pain? Oh, about a 2. Well, we'll give you something right now. And they throw a pill at you. They want you to be in pain. What? Well, What's wrong with a little pain? See? Live with that. It's okay. Zeal for Christ is to keep going when you don't want to go. It's fulfilling the responsibility when your flesh would rather do something else. That's zeal for good works. You're in Titus Go to your left there and go to Colossians chapter 4. Paul mentions a fellow here named Epaphras. Epaphras is a great guy. Notice what Paul says about him in uh, Colossians 4 and verse 12. If you're there, you say amen. amen. Notice what he says. Epaphras, who's one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you. And them in Laodicea and Hierapolis. He has a great zeal for you. Paul said, I'm going to tell you something about this guy. He's a servant. He's one of you. He prays fervently for you. But man, he has a zeal for you. He has a zeal to minister to you, to help you, to serve you. That's what we need. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, 
the priest and the Levite both go by the bleeding guy who'd been beat up. And they both ask themselves, if I stop and help this guy, what's going to happen to me? But the good Samaritan goes by and looks at that bleeding fella and says, if I don't stop and help this guy, what's going to happen to him? What's going to happen to him? Zeal. Can I say this? Faithful servants never retire. You can retire from your career, but you never retire from serving God. Amen? I'm thankful for the men we have in our church that have retired from their career, but they sure haven't retired from serving God. A great blessing to our church. A great blessing to the work of God. Retire from the factory, retire from the shop, retire from the office, but don't retire from serving God. You continue to serve Him all the days of your life. God delights in honoring zeal. Look through the list of Christians that have been mightily used by God. The men that have left the deepest marks on Christianity. I grew up in the Can Baptist Temple and that was for years home of the Christian Hall of Fame. And through the hallways of the church were the giant portraits of men and little captions about what they did for God. And those men that, that, that we still look to and that, 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 that had their mark on the, the church of God and the history of the work of God. The men who engaged the enemy. The men that God used were not just men of learning and literary talent as they were men of zeal. They stood up front at turning points in the history of the church. It could be said that they were not afraid to stand alone. They didn't care if their motives were misinterpreted. They considered everything a loss for the sake of the truth. Their one consuming thing was the advancement of the gospel of Christ to the glory of God. They were all on fire, so they lit others on fire. They were all wide awake, so they woke others up. And they were all working, so they shamed others into working too. They were men like Moses who came down from the mountain and their face shone with the glory of God. And they knew that they'd been in the presence of the Lord. Zeal is contagious, my friend. Nothing's more useful to professing Christians than to see a real, live, zealous follower of Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing is quite as inspiring and moving and helpful as when you see someone else who we say is on fire for God. We look at that and say, man, I want to burn like that. I want to be on fire like that. One single zealous Christian in a town. One single zealous Christian in a church. One single zealous Christian in a city. One single zealous Christian in a family. What an impact it could have. What a difference it could make. I ask you a question with all love tonight. Where's your zeal? Where's your zeal? Where's your zeal for the things of God? Where's your zeal for the glory of God? Where's your zeal to share the gospel of Christ? The characteristic of the Lord was zeal. He said, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. You ever been so so consumed with something, and we use that expression sometimes. That's just eating me alive. Because see, it's just, it's, and he said, I'm eating up with zeal for the Lord. The Lord was zeal. Angels were zealous, and they are zealous. Where's your zeal, Christian? Oftentimes, I think our zeal is misapplied, misdirected. 
We have zeal for the things of this world, but no zeal for God. Zeal to read the, the paper or read the, 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 the magazine or uh, zeal to uh, be on the smartphone, but no zeal to read His Word. No zeal to hear the things of God. Zeal for gold, but no zeal for the unsearchable riches of Christ. Zeal for family, or zeal for pleasures, or zeal for my daily pursuits, but no zeal for God, and no zeal for heaven, and no zeal for eternity. I guess the message would be what, what the Lord said to the church at Laodicea, wake up, be zealous, and repent. Let me encourage those of you tonight who are zealous. And I just would encourage you to keep on being zealous. Don't stop doing the things you did at first. Don't be like Ephesus who said you left your first love. Keep that first love. Keep the fire burning. Don't, I don't want it to be said that the things I did in the first part of my Christian life were, were better than they were at the end of my Christian life. I want to I burn as bright at the end as I did at the beginning. I want to be as zealous at the end as I was at the beginning. I don't want them to come and say, yeah, I heard you when you were a young preacher and boy, you were excited and you shouted then and now, now you just kind of share with everyone. No, I want them to say, man, you sound just like you did back then. And that's the way it should be. Beware of cooling down. Beware of cooling off because you become lukewarm then. I understand that it may be true that wise young believers are very rare, but I think it's probably true that zealous old believers are very rare. Zealous old believers. I don't want to look at the young Christian who's excited about God and excited about things of God and they may have a zeal without knowledge. But I don't want them to look at me and say, well, and I, and I just tell them, well, someday you'll cool down and be like me. I hope not. No, they ought to look at those of us who are older and been down the road and we ought to be like Jehu and say, hey, come here, get in my chariot and see my zeal for the Lord. Ride along with me. For every person you think does too much for the cause of Christ, I'll show you a hundred that do too little. Guarantee. Jesus said we ought to work because the night is coming when no man can work. Only, only one life, so soon it will pass. And only what's done for Christ will last. Can't believe how fast the years go by. We ought to give and teach and visit and work and pray as if it was our last opportunity to do so. I ought to, ought, to, ought to preach every sermon as if it might be the last time I'll ever preach. Because one time it will be the last time. And I don't know when that will be, but I want to give every message the best I have. And you ought to give every service the best you have. We don't know when the last time will come. I don't know about you, but I want to be zealously effective in a good thing. In church, in giving, and in good works for the Lord Jesus. Be zealous. Let's stand for prayer, shall we? Father, we pray this evening that you'll take the truth tonight and, oh, God, help us to have zeal. Help us to have a passion for the things of God. That whatever it is we do, we do it with zeal. We do it with enthusiasm. We do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
We're energized by you working in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Forgive us for being so passionate and for so zealous for things that do not matter. And so lukewarm about things that do. Father, I pray that as we do your work in our area, in our city, in our state, and in our country, and through our missionaries reach around the world, that we would do so with zeal. As we prepare for our country fair and the community comes to our church, that they'd see people zealous for the things of God, zealous for the glory of God. It would consume us You'd be zealous for your church and zealous in our giving. Zealous of good works. I pray that each person tonight, Lord, would look in their heart and ask themselves, where is my zeal for the Lord? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I feel like I ought to pray this evening for you. I wonder if you're here tonight and would say, Pastor, I, I need the zeal of God in my life. God has spoken to my heart tonight. And I know he's, he's dealing with me. And I want the zeal. I, wanna, I don't want to be a Christian. I want to be a zealous Christian. I want to I tell people, come see my zeal for the Lord. Oh, you can look at your life and you can see zeal for some things, but you're not seeing the zeal for God you ought to. You say, preacher, the Lord has dealt with my heart tonight. Pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. That's good. Thank you. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be people that are zealous for our God. That others would see the passion we have to please you and to bring glory to you. Oh, Lord, change our families and change our churches and change our communities by people who are passionate about serving you, loving you, and pleasing you. May you be glorified in our lives. Dismiss us now with your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. Help us to please you in all we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 128 in your book if you need it. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. Let's sing it together, all right? Here we go. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, come right on up. <laughs>